Thank you for having me. Nice yes. to see you all. So how are things in your world? Uh, things are actually going quite well. Um, we have been coordinating a, it had been every week and now we're going to every other week, uh, COVID emergency response uh, Zoom call across the network of farm to plate uh, organizations. We've had 90 plus people on those calls. Senator Leahy actually joined us last week in person on, on the phone. Um, we've had the congressional delegation staff joining us each time. Uh, we've had up to, during those calls, we have updates about what's happening with the emergency uh, feeding programs, uh, getting meals out uh, all across the state. We've also heard from distributors, from uh, retail and restaurant establishments and the Grocers Association, uh, from Hunger Mountain Co-op, representing the co-ops. So we've been really trying to um, get uh, a full view of what's been happening across the food system uh, in real time and using that as a way to keep people feeling connected so that they have knowledge about what's happening in different parts um, so that we're not duplicating, that we're really coordinating and amplifying the work getting done. So those have been going really well um, and will continue for the foreseeable future. Uh, we've also at the Jobs Fund have been holding weekly calls with a number of value-added uh, food and farm and forest products businesses that have been uh, business clients of ours, both past and present. And those have also been extremely uh, good. And I will say the sort of the takeaway is that these calls that involve businesses where they're able to share with each other the kinds of um, uh, worker safety uh, efforts that they're doing in-house has been really mm -hmm. valuable because it's given each other ideas about things that they can be doing to ensure worker safety uh, in their plants if they're considered essential and open. And we've also had Lawrence Miller on the call with each one because he's one of our coaches. And so he provides an update of what's happening with all the federal responses. And we, we spent, he get, provides advice about, you know, should you be going for the EIDL, should go for P, PPP, and just sort of like how to navigate uh, and what to expect from Department of Labor, because he's tracking all of the state level and federal level stuff. So he's able to provide a very concise view of what these businesses should be doing to both protect their cash, um, but also protect their workers and be able to continue to pay their workers if they can. So those have been really, really valuable. Um, I know they're happening in other venues as well, um, but we're, uh, we're continuing to have those calls weekly. It gives us real insight into what's going on. We have, you know, we have Upper Valley Produce as one of our uh, clients. We have uh, Lawson's Finest, so we're getting a sense of what's happening with the breweries. Uh, Peterson's quality malt, so we're getting a sense of what's happening more on the grower side of things, uh, et cetera. So uh, those have been really valuable. Um, I would say overall, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, so heartened by the kinds of, of things that organizations are stepping up and doing in the way in which they're working together from the food hubs working together to figure out distrib additional distribution, um, farmers who have had been selling into restaurants and institutions pivoting to both sell online and or get into the food hub network to get their products uh, where they want to go. Many farms have, have finally taken the leap of doing online sales with on-farm pickups. That's a big deal for, for many of them and, and it's, a, it's a step into a whole new world. I think one of the questions is going to be long term, are they going to maintain that is this a short term only sort of when we have these kind of crises or are they gonna find that it actually is something that they should continue to do uh, regularly because they're, they are getting sales. Um, I would say across the, the system, you have a real range happening. You may have heard this uh, from other folks you've talked to. You know, there are definitely some farms inc including livestock farmers, vegetable produce farmers who are doing quite well with their sales. Um, I know of a number of farms that have actually sold out of their final root crops that they had for the end of the year because the co-ops have been at, you know, bought everything they had basically, and now we got to wait till the next uh, harvest. Um, and then, you know, those the restaurants, obviously, uh, the brew houses, 
really struggling, obviously. Um, but uh, overall, people really stepping up and trying to find ways of, of helping each other. Uh, been just really heartened by the number of businesses like the Skinny Pancake and Lawson's Finest and many others who are making donations, uh, figuring out how to do <clears throat> meal kits, getting into the, into the emergency food system. Um, it's been really quite amazing to see how people have stepped up really quickly and mobilized. And I, I, I have to say, I think that's in part because of the investments that we've made over the last 10 years of really building this network because we know each other, <laughs> we know what each other does. And so we're able to really immediately get, call the right people to get things to happen rather than, oh, who should I call? Um, who's doing that? Because we, we know this information. So um, anyways, it's, uh, it's been, it's been int very interesting to sort of watch the response to the cross. Have, have you heard any uh, complaints from uh, the cons your constituents on being able to uh, get through to the PPP program or any of these other federal programs to, um, and not be able to receive any money yet? Um, the clients, we, we checked in with all of them yesterday and many of them had started to get um, their loan documents. They had gotten approval. So the, it's, the, the process is starting. A lot of this has to do, I think, uh, quite frankly, with who, which bank you go with, and and their level of of expertise in working with SBA. Um, I know there's a number of banks that are like hadn't been SBA uh, lenders, and they're trying to hurry up and get approved so that they can do loans as well. So, um, if you if you go with banks that have uh, a lot of experience working with SBA, it seems to be moving as uh, as quickly, uh, and it's quite a large amount of money, actually. I think there was something like $842 million that's already been approved, which is- 83 as of this morning. Unbelievable. So yeah. the money is starting to flow. I think the bigger challenge has been the EIDL program. There's been a lot of confusion about that. The guidance has been a, a, like just all over the place or lack thereof. Uh, and folks are just trying to figure out, you know, which are the right, what are, what are the programs that are best suited for them? And what we've been advising is to be really uh, make sure that people are really keeping very good documentation because if they want to have this um, money uh, turned from a loan into, in essence, a grant and be forgiven, they have to have good documentation. So we're recommending in, in many cases to make sure that you actually have set it up as a separate bank account so that you can have very clear ties between the money and the personnel and the rent. <laughs> um, so uh, we're also rec definitely pushing a lot around uh, making sure people realize that if they have existing SBA loans, that SBA is forgiving those uh, loans over the next six months. Um, so to really be in communication with your SBA officer and those kind of your bank, your loan officers and that kind of thing. Um, other questions for uh, Alan? Uh, Ruth? Thanks, Bobby. Um, hey, Ellen, it's good to see you. Um, I uh, We had testimony, uh, I think, last week from Allison Eastman at the agency um, about the update on the H-2A workers and how some of them, how it's been much slower, obviously, because of international travel, travel restrictions and the like. And I asked her um, about, it, it seems to me a good opportunity for Vermonters who are out of work to maybe fill in some of the slots that normally would have been filled in by these workers. And she said that they were working with the Sustainable Jobs Fund um, as one of the partners to help fill positions at farms or food producers that needed um, labor. And it looks, from your expression, it looks like maybe that wasn't accurate. So I'm curious <laughs> what you're doing in terms of, you know, filling in for, uh, farms that need labor because they are in a, a critical business. And yeah, no, no uh, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I mean, we're when we get word that there are farms like high mowing seeds, for instance, had 10 positions they were trying to fill immediately a couple of weeks ago, uh, we do everything to get it out through our network to try to get it, it in front of people so that if they are in a position where they could uh, step up and do that, that they are. But um, 
you know, other than just sort of letting people know to please let us let us know <laughs> to have these kind of positions so that we can help get it out, the word out. Um, but I think it really is up to each individual farmer to try to um, work their networks uh, and get it get it out there. I think because the, you know the whole H2A piece is it, it, it looks like it's going to happen, like it's just a timing thing. I, my sense is that they're that most farms are trying to um, sort of hold off and be able to wait for, for their guys to show up because that is their preference. Um, but um, it's okay, so maybe maybe I misunderstood what she was talking about. It sounded like there was more of a coordinated effort between you guys and UVM and a couple other organizations. To... No, it's possible that UVM and NOFA are doing that, but not us. Okay, um, because uh, you know traditionally for the last few years, agriculture, like pretty much every sector in Vermont, has had a shortage of workers, and now now we have a, a shortage of of jobs. So maybe we can turn the tide on on at least the ag sector getting more um, slots filled and getting more people working in agriculture during this crisis. What about <clears throat> um, the farm stands can be open, I believe, Ellen. Do you hear anything from uh, people with farm stands? Uh, just that, that if they have farm stands, that sales are definitely increased, especially around meat. Um, because, you know, greens are just starting to come in. Um, if folks had root vegetables left, uh, you know, whatever's available from last year's harvest is, is being uh, put out there. But, um, you know, a lot of folks have been looking for local meat in particular, and that has been uh, a major uptick. And is there a major difference between uh, farm stands and farmer markets, why, why can't three farm stands set up side by side and, and call it a farm stand bonanza or something? Uh, would, is, that, is that permissible? That's a good question. M my understanding is that uh, it's uh, untested. Because we're, I mean, we're all getting many, many calls in regards to the farmer markets and hopefully, I don't know if you've heard anything from anyone in regards to how that process is uh, working out with, you know, with the groups. Have you heard anything? Yeah, I else? mean, I, I was on the phone call that happened, the emergency call and Nettie can talk more about it because I see she's uh, here listening in. Uh, there was an emergency call last Friday with the farm with a lot of the farmers market managers that NOFA uh, organized, uh, just as the uh, governor's announcement had been made, and or the governor's announcement had been made. And so a couple hours after that, they had a call to check in, and they hadn't yet received the the guidance that came later that day. Um, so I've been, you know, in communication with uh, with Maddie and Grace at NOFA um, to keep up on things and to provide any support that I can and, and just strategy uh, with how to navigate this. Um, and, you know, and obviously talk with a lot with the folks at the agency and, and understand the very difficult position that they're in. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think anything is dead yet. And one of the things that I had encouraged on the, on the phone last week with the farmer's market managers was to get really clear about what would be the drop dead date for them to be able to open and still be viable. Because right. there's, two, there's two components, right? There's the individual vendors and are they going to want to show up? I mean, I have uh, one of my staff members has family members that have, uh, have immune compromised and they've already decided they're not gonna participate in their farmer's market this summer, even if things settle down because the risk is there for them personally as a family, right? So there's gonna be some vendors that are gonna choose <clears throat> not to for their own reasons and usually health related. And then there's the issue. And so they need, the vendors need to make a decision economically about at what point in the season, if things are still shut down, they're, it works economically for them to participate in the market. And then on the flip side, each market you know, has its own economic viability that it has to think about because they have fees and various expenses that they need to cover that they're capturing through the market process. So they need to decide at what point the farmer's market 
them, themselves as economically viable beyond which date they, they just, it doesn't make sense for them to open or could they make any accommodation to be partially open or whatever? So I don't know to what extent each market manager has done that, uh, that thought process. Um, I know the woman from the, the market manager from Burlington, you know, she just jumped right on and said, well, May 1st for us. So, and there's other farmers markets that normally don't open until the end of May. So, you know, it's, it's a range here. You know, if, if things open up by May 15th, then for those that normally would open on May 15th, as long as vendors are willing to show up, then, we're, then they're good to go. But, you know, there are a number of markets that want to be open by, by May 1st. And then we, of course, have current winter markets that are winding down their season. So it, yep. it's complicated because uh, as, as Senator Hardy said, the, the, the primary issue here is, is public health and safety. And then how do we do that in a way that uh, enables farmers markets and, and Vermonters to be able to access their farmers markets? Yeah, Chris? Um, we, I, I just want to make clear, and Ellen, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I do not believe markets will be open this weekend, but there is an announcement, we, we anticipate an announcement that there's sort of a path to getting them open before long. Is, is that your understanding and what you're hearing? Um, I was just listening in before you all got started, and that was, that's, that's what I'm hearing from you all. So I hadn't heard the latest uh, within the last 24 hours of how things have been moving. But, you know, th this has been a daily, everything changes every day on this topic. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm a day out, I'm a day behind. Chris, where did you hear that? I didn't hear that. Um, I, I, I'm trying to remember all, all of the various calls, but my impression, um, somewhere along the lines was just that not a, not exactly uh, where not exactly if but when and not immediately but an announcement sort of sooner and later is the hope and I see Maddie is offering us something in the chat so we'll get into it but I just wondered if Ellen well connected had any more up to date there was they, the governor was quoted in um, seven days, I think it was, this, last night or this morning, saying that they were going to release a guidance, they, that they expected to release some guidance, let's say Thursday, they're talking about Friday, tomorrow. Right. And that farmers markets were moving up to the top of the list of what they're thinking about, but it was still not, there was no indication as to what the guidance would actually say. I also think it's interesting what Bobby said, because that's what I've said as well. Like, if it's okay to have a farm stand here, what if somebody decided to put a farm stand 20 feet from my farm stand, would that be okay? It seems like do we, it's a good question as to whether or not that would be okay. Because that's really what a farmer's market would come down to, it would be a group of vendors keeping space between each other. And they also all realize that their health is at risk. And there are so I've gotten notes from both sides and some farmers have said, I don't wanna to go to the market. And I was like, well, that's cool. You don't have to go to the market. Nobody's going to force anybody to go to a market, particularly if they're compromised in any way. So I think that something can be worked out. But anyway, the, the information we got was from the governor being quoted in seven days. Yeah. And he said that yesterday on, when he was doing a press conference or something. I, you know, listened to some of it and it was pretty clear they were going to come out today was uh, tomorrow with, with some new guidelines. Uh, Brian, Brian's been trying to jump in. Yeah, Brian, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Chris. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering in the determination that was made by ACCD, do they see a distinction between farmers markets that operate indoors and farmers markets that operate outdoors? I, I should think. I think that is one of the considerations. Okay. I mean, it seems as though, if you use common sense, the outside venue would be a little bit easier to uh, mitigate than the indoor one, but I don't know, and I didn't know if they made a distinction that said, because some markets go 12 months a year, Rutland does, there's, there's an indoor market pretty much all year, and then at, one, at some point, usually in May, they move outside. And um, I just didn't know if they had made that distinction when they made the uh, determination. 
And Michael had something I think that he wanted. I'm not privy to that uh, detail, um, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of the consideration. Okay. And I see Michael was going to maybe weigh in on whether two or three different farms could, in a sense, congregate close by each other and still call it a farm stand. Do, do you have something on that, Michael? Uh, yes, farm stands are supposed to actually be on the farm where where they are, um, the farmer is located. So you can't have three different farms having a farm stand on the same property. Yeah. Um, there was a discussion a few years ago about authorizing um, kind of group CSAs to be located on individual farms, but that that never that never materialized. So a farm stand is supposed to be on the individual farm's property. Yeah. Um, uh, Ruth. Yeah, I just wanted to to mention a couple things. One that I and Ellen, you may have more information, but my impression is that this year um, enrollment in CSAs has skyrocketed as more and more people are trying to get um, local food safely. Um, and CSAs often have, even though it's not a joint CSA, one, you know, if there's a produce CSA, they might have milk or meat from a different farmer, but that farmer's not in, on the CSA. They just sell their product to the, another farmer who then includes it in their CSA. Um, I know that mine does that. So I think that we should be highlighting the fact that CSAs are doing really, really well and people are getting, you know, signing up to get local produce and vegetables and meat and milk, et cetera, through local CSAs. Um, and I know a lot of farmers, as you mentioned, are starting online sales and doing these sort of pop-up farm stands that may be temporary, but they're doing the best they can to get their product out there to consumers. Um, and I also just wanted to give a shout out to both the Farm to Plate and the NoFi, no Maddie's on the call too, um, websites. You both have really good resources and I have been sharing those with people in my um, district. So just if you haven't checked them out yet, both of them have really good um, websites. Great, thanks. Um, well, if, if there isn't anything else, uh, we're going to be, uh, for Ellen, uh, we're going to move on and uh, talk with Michael um, in regards to uh, our Addison County Field Days issue uh, for a few minutes and then We'll go back uh, and pick uh, Maddie up, uh, you know, in ten or fifteen minutes. Senator, so thank yes. Can I just can I just add one last final thing? I did um, send along to Linda. It's on your website. Um, a short uh, speech that I gave actually back in mid February about um, the the very uh, vulnerable position that we are in with the very concentrated supply chain for food that we have in this country. And um, there's a couple of graphics on the third page that show this with some research that was done uh, within the last year about the food flows within the United States. And you'll see in that visual how uh, constrained we are with getting food flows basically up the I-95 corridor. And, um, and it makes us very vulnerable. And my speech was actually about climate emergency issues, but obviously pandemics are, are showing themselves right now. So I would just encourage you to take a look at, at that if you're interested, because after we get through this emergency period, then the recovery and resilience phases need to start. And we're very actively involved in conversations with the other New England states about how to significantly increase regional food production for regional consumption and to rework our supply chain so that more of the food being produced in New England stays in New England. And uh, I'd be happy to come back some other time and talk with you about that. It's very early just getting underway, but um, a lot of people because of this pandemic are really realizing how vulnerable we are in the region uh, because of the food being so concentrated within a few, um, in a few areas and, and just, you know, seeing crops being tilled under in Florida and milk being dumped and now issues with meat processing yeah. plants in other parts of the country going down because of worker safety and all those kinds of issues. We're just really vulnerable. And I think we have a basically a once in a lifetime opportunity right now to, resh to reshape our supply chain. And 
be able to um, uh, become more resilient and, and more self-sufficient within the region. Yeah, thank you for that offer. I think Chris has a question. Well, I, I, I'm, this is music to my ears, uh, Ellen, and we look forward to partnering with you on that. Um, I, I'm curious, given your work on the on the Working Lands Fund and and um, the discussion you see ahead, do, do we? Is it fair to to summarize that Working Lands has, in some ways, been about markets more than food systems? Or, or I mean, it's a blend. I, I'm not trying to be critical, but are you now suggesting that there is a little bit of a shift in terms of uh, food systems as opposed to we've been working hard to stimulate markets rightly? I think we need both, but I'm just curious if if that's a fair summary because I sort of trying to be banging on this drum for a while and, and I think the pandemic does make it very plain, uh, the vulnerability, but I've kind of, hope that our food production could feed us and and um i wouldn't say it's met with resistance but it's not been a clear mesh and i'm just wondering if, if that's a I, I don't know really what i'm after other than to say this is great news i look forward to doing it but i, I wonder kind of why we haven't been doing it so far yeah it, it looks like we can grow a lot of food we just can't get it to market yeah, so, and just the, the really quick response, and I'm happy to talk with you offline too, Senator Pearson, about this is, you know, with Working Lands Grants, they have been a combination of trying to open up new markets, increasing production for certain types of products, um, and also strengthening the distribution and processing system. So they, it really has, we have taken a very full food systems view of all the components of the supply chain and trying to strengthen different parts and pieces. And we and in the deliberation around the various uh, grant proposals, we think about it from that from that lens of like, is this a strategic grant that's going to help this part of the supply chain? Is it going to do this? Um, so we do really think about that um, and try to be st as strategic as possible. Well, but Mr. Chair, I, I I would just say once we get out of the immediate crisis and yeah. make sure our people are are working and and have incomes secured. I, I hope this can be a big focus of ours. I, I, I think it's uh, overdue and, and I'm very excited. Incredible potential for our rural economy and for food safety. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much, Ellen. And uh, we'll make a note of that, Chris. And I'm sure Bruce will keep that in our notes. All right. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Take care. Be safe. Yeah. Thanks again. Uh, Michael, uh, in regards to uh, the Addison County situation, have, have you done any research or any more uh, thought, uh, had any more thoughts about what uh, we might be able to do to rectify that situation? Because, you know, July or August is coming and we want to make sure that those folks are going to be able to open uh, uh, their fairgrounds with their welcome center. Can, can you just uh, remind me what the issue is? Well, the issue is they want, ANRDC wants them to, to do a um, uh, septic system. Okay, I okay, thank you. Uh, so Michael, did you, did you look into that any further? with anyone other than Matt? Um, I, I, I have talked to Matt Chapman at a and but I haven't gone beyond that. What I want to highlight, and I, there's a document on the website, which it's background information. And it notes that last year you changed the holding tank law to allow holding tanks to be used um, for buildings or structures that won't that'll host events uh, for 28 days or less in a calendar year. And so that's how Addison County is going forward with their wastewater treatment. But there are requirements for holding tanks underneath the statute. One of which is that um, there needs to be a financial bond or other 
financial surety sufficient to finance the maintenance of the holding tank for the life of the system for which is at least 20 years. And it, in addition, the holding tank needs to be capable of holding at least 14 days of the design flow from the building. So in talking to Matt at a &R, the the issue, and I'm just the messenger, I don't know what's accurate, who's right and who's wrong. I'm sure the fair has another side of the story, but a &R is saying that um, the fair has missed all the deadlines for permitting that the agency still needs to figure out what the adequate flow um, at the for the system is and that the fair has not provided um, the required financial instrument to uh, provide surety for the 20 years or the life of the tank. So I have, when we last talked about this in committee, I told you that you at the legislature has addressed these kinds of issues in the past through legislation. And at the, the um, end of the document that I, I put online, it's on page seven of the document on your webpage, I, I've given you an example of that. In 2001, you addressed uh, the use of holding tanks at two different places, one the Shrewsbury Library and then an Oak Hill Children's Center in Pownall. Pownall. And you not withstood certain requirements for holding tanks um, in order to authorize that the holding tank to go in uh, at those two places. So you have that up, you've, this is precedent, prior practice. If you wanted to legislate around um, the use of the holding tank at the Addison County field and uh, field and fair days, you you have precedent for doing that. And then it would be how you would want to legislate around it. The well, of course, the fair is only open five days, and I'm sure both the properties in Shrewsbury and in the uh, the library and the other place are open more than five days a year. And so I think we would certainly be within our bounds to do something um, similar to what we did back then when we allowed those tanks to go in. And, uh, and maybe we need to change the days of that from we put 14 in there uh, when we wrote the bill last year. Uh, so should we change that back to five or six uh, days uh, if we were going to do legislation? Well, well. Um, first, in my discussions with Matt, Matt said that they are they are using a five day standard for the flow and not a 14 day standard because, and, and, and they're, I, I think that that's a big concession for them. Yeah. Um, uh, but they still need to figure out what's the adequate flow. And so that, that is what they're trying to do. Um, I also, uh, I posed some questions to Matt the other day about um, would there be funding available to the uh, field and farm days to help with them putting in the system. Matt is listening to this and he just emailed me and said that uh, the agency is going to meet internally this afternoon on the questions that I posed to him about financing and, and other questions. Um, so I, I think uh, you'll have some additional information from them, uh, hopefully by the end of the week. Yeah. Uh, any comments from anyone else, Ruth? Michael, I just wanted to um, clarify because we did a what I thought was supposed to have been a legislative fix on this issue yeah. last year, and it didn't end up 
being a legislative fix on this issue. And, you know, it was a, certainly a learning process for me as a first year legislator. So I'm just curious, what did we, what did we miss last year that, that we could do this year? I thought we, yeah, I thought we fixed it, but we obviously didn't. So what did, do you get my question? <laughs> I do, I okay. do. Um, so prior to last year, a holding tank wouldn't have been authorized for use at the field and fair days. And they would have had to put in a full system um, which would likely have been more expensive than a holding tank. Um, so you, what you did last year is you amended <laughs> the holding tank law to allow for a holding tank to be used at um, a property where it's only going to be used uh, no more than 28 days in any calendar year to host events. And it has to be owned by a uh, charitable or religious or nonprofit organization. So that gave the field days the opportunity to use a holding tank, which is likely less expensive than a full, probably in Addison County, a full mound system in, in Addison County. But there are still requirements for the use of a holding tank. It's just that they have to be designed appropriately, which is the flow issue, and they need financial surety so that uh, the agency, the state is confident that they will be maintained properly. They have to be pumped out. They have to be, there's a, there's a whole suite of requirements for, for, for what the tank needs. It has to have a monitoring device. It has an alert system, et cetera, et cetera. And so, there needs to be financial surety there that the, all of that is running properly. So okay. yes, you, you, you fixed it, but the field day still needs to meet the requirements for its use. We, we fixed it, but we didn't go quite far enough and use the same uh, exemptions that we allowed uh, the other two places that have holding tanks or Right. Well, so well, that, I, I, I want to be clear what you not withstood in, in 2001 for Shrewsbury and for the Oak Hill, it, it wouldn't be the same. You would have to address different criteria here different. and not withstand different criteria here. Um, and so that that's, I just gave you Shrewsbury and Oak Hill as examples of how you have legislated around holding tanks in the past for specific sites. Yeah, uh, Chris. I keep then, jumping ahead of Brian. Brian, go ahead. Oh, I, I just have three quick points. I hope I hope they're quick. How much does it cost? Does anyone know to get a bond? Is that a really expensive situation, or is it something that would not necessarily be that costly? That's first question. Secondly, do, would if we not withstood this particular thing, would that include that bond situation? And the third thing is, I'm assuming we're taking this up, even though technically it doesn't have anything to do with a COVID situation, that it would give assurance to the uh, Addison group that down the road they, they wouldn't face this hurdle in order to open up. Well, <clears throat> I think, yes. And, you know, that's kind of a timely deal. And I'm fine with that. We may not be back in session full blown. So we're going to have to probably add something to some language rolling through that we do remotely. Okay. And I'm fine with that. I just wanted to make sure that that point was at least raised. Yeah. And Chris? Uh, I, I'm feeling a little torn here because um, I, I, I have enjoyed the Addison County Field Days personally, and, and I think it's an important community event. Um, but can you just restate, Michael, we, we quote unquote solved this problem last year, but we didn't give them a carte blanche. We said, you know, here are the ways that you can use a holding tank, which is outside of the norms of our expectations. And then what are the criteria within that exemption that has been so hard for them to to me, can you just restate that? I'm sorry, I know you did it already, but. 
So, so this is again according to the agency. Um, well, let me step back. So there is a is a section of law that allows for the use of holding tanks in the state instead of a fully designed wastewater system slash septic system. There are limited um, eligibility or limited uses where the holding tank can be used instead of the wastewater system. You amended those eligibility requirements last year to allow for an event, uh, a building that holds events for no more than 28 days in any calendar year and is a nonprofit. But there are still requirements for the use of a holding tank, one of which is that it needs to basically be adequately designed so that it doesn't pose a threat to public health. And yeah. one of those requirements is that it has to be designed for the appropriate flow. And the standard that is in statute is that it shall be capable of holding at least 14 days of the design flow from the building. Now the agency is saying that they're not gonna use the 14 day standard, they're gonna use the five day standard because that's the actual flow at the field days, but they actually have to figure that out. They have to figure out what the flow is in order to approve the design of the system. And the agency is saying that they, um, that they have to confirm, finalize the actual flows from the monitoring performed last year and they need to provide, the fair needs to do this. They need to, the fair needs to provide a final design for the system and provide a final design for the water supply for that system. And so the fair, according to the agency, has not done that. The other requirement that is at issue is that you have a financial bond or other surety to, um, ensure the maintenance of the system for 20 years. And the agency is saying that the, that the fair has yet to provide that. They are looking for, uh, they have proposed to the agency to use a line of credit instead of a bond or other approved line of surety. The agency doesn't wanna use a line of credit. They say as a general matter, lines of credit are normally not adequate um, for a regulatory program and are equivalent to a financial <laughs> test corporate guarantee. They, they, they want a bond or other, or other um, approved surety. So those are the two issues, the flow and design and the financial surety for the 20 year life. Yeah, and <clears throat> the flow part, uh, I don't wanna drag this on, uh, that's all was measured last session. And what, what they're saying at the fair is they attract X number of thousands of people. They had like three facilities, three bathroom facilities before. Now they added the fourth facility. But the same number of people go to the fair each year, roughly, within a thousand. And that, so they aren't taking on any more waste than they were before. And, and they're just dividing it up amongst uh, four facilities instead of three. And so they're, you know, they're kind of in an argument with DC over, over having to put up a bond um, to, uh, you know, to move forward, which I think we got a letter from uh, Carrie's wife, uh, from representative from down there, and it was quite a lot of money they were going to have to pay out each year for that bond. And rather than to keep this discussion going, Ruth, could could you look into that uh, sometime? And and I think. The information is all there. Their engineer just hasn't sent it in to, uh, to DC, but uh, Matt seems to be 
uh, fairly good to work with and and we should get this resolved. But go ahead, Chris. No? I, that, that's good. Ruth looking into it satisfies me. Yeah, I'll, I'll get more information from Addison County Fair and Field Days and, uh, and we can come back to this. Um, so yeah, we'll do. And <clears throat> so we'll, we'll move on to the uh, next item. Uh, Maddie, uh, you're on, you're on. Yeah, um, you're muted, um, but um, we haven't got a, a lot of time because I see Liam Berthium's already come on and Diane's there and and uh, I would expect Catherine to be on for 11 or shortly thereafter. So uh, Maddie, why don't you give us an update on, uh, maybe you've been in on some of the negotiations that maybe we're supposed to get some announcement tomorrow. So yeah, and I actually um, just saw that news for the first time yesterday too, um, when the seven day story came out. So I unfortunately don't have any more information than what's there um, and we haven't been involved in any additional conversations about what those guidance, um, guidelines might look like. And uh, I was hoping that uh, I, I would love to hear directly from someone from the Department of Health um, or the Department of Public Safety because we, at NOFA are really uh, hoping to convene, you know, some type of working group to work together with those uh, with those agencies to develop some guidelines that they would consider workable. Because um, our understanding was that really the um, the issues with the last round of guidance that the agency of Ag was hoping to put out um, were were coming. The decisions were really coming down from the Department of Health um, and Public Safety. So we're hoping to work together with them going forward, and we're just waiting and seeing um, as you all are to see what the guidance looks like that comes out tomorrow. Well, um, the only I, I the committee should weigh in on on my thoughts here. That I'm going, I I think you know tomorrow we should get what get what they propose, and then maybe early next week if if things are still way up in the air, um, we meet again to try to. <laughs> resolved with with somebody from the administration uh, but we ought to give them an opportunity to you know uh, a few more days to to see what they come up with and um, hopefully because you know we've got we want people to be safe and healthy and don't want to spread this darn disease any further than it already is and uh you know, the farmers have, have got a pretty good record of producing good, uh, fresh, uh, wholesome food, and we don't want unhealthy uh, people to be spreading uh, COVID-19. Um, so maybe uh, we'll see what they do uh, tomorrow and go from there. Any other suggestions? Bobby? Yes. A couple of thoughts. Um, maybe the first one is kind of a question for Maddie. I saw one email, which might have been actually to Senator Hardy. I forget where there were so many emails floating around, but in which Abby, I think it was Abby, said that they had been working with NOFA on developing the guidelines that NOFA developed. I'm sort of paraphrasing, but it's that, I mean, I, I'm wondering just how involved you have you been working with them to develop those guidelines? Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we had work, been working with the agency really, really closely. Um, as of a couple of weeks ago, we had been having regular conversations with Alyssa and Abby um, at the agency to develop some guidelines that we all um, felt might be workable. And my understanding is that, um, I don't know all the details, but it sounded like you know Abby or Alyssa had sort of run those proposals up the chain. Um, and then what had come back from um, the Department of Health was, uh, what was then reported on the call last Friday, which was uh, at least initially that farmers markets were not able to operate in any form, um, even curbside pickup and pre-order. But then that was later um, somewhat further clarified by the additional guidance put out by the agency um, that farmers markets basically were not able to do any 
um, in-person transactions per the executive order. So yeah, prior to, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were working really closely with the agency to try to develop those guidelines. And the ones that we shared with you last week are sort of what still stand in terms of what we would like to see implemented. Uh, and those were developed, you know, in concert um, with the agency, not to say that they were necessarily advocating strongly for those exact proposals, but we did work together with them on them. Um, and, you know, they were developed in looking at what some markets in Vermont have proposed uh, they're able to do somewhat what's happening in other states. Um, yeah, so those are still kind of what we would like to see implemented and we will sort of be also curious to see what comes out tomorrow and we'll kind of respond accordingly. Um, yeah, I do want to say also that I was able to take a look at the letter uh, that Michael Grady drafted for the House Ag Committee, and we really appreciate that letter. Uh, I also think the second version of it is um, better and more clear in terms of, you know, the first letter referenced the inability of farmers markets to, to even do um, pre-ordering curbside pickup, which is necessarily the case if they could do it without any person-to-person -person transaction. Uh, so the second letter is, is clear in that regard. Um, and we would definitely, we're really appreciative of both the committee support on this and would um, encourage you to, to join in signing on to that if you're able. So it, seems, uh, just, it seems to me that like to wait until after they put out the guidance, then there's no sense in us writing them a letter if, it's, if they've already done what they're gonna do. So I would like us personally, I would like us as a committee to go on record as supporting the kinds of things, statements that are made in the letter so that they are aware that that's our position instead of waiting for them to come out with the guidance and then reacting to it because that's what we've been doing all along and sort of tired of waiting for their guidances and then reacting to them when the guidances tend to be the same one that they gave us last time <laughs> that's well, more of a thought for the committee to consider i i would hope i mean you know anson and i had a pretty good chat uh uh, yesterday, and I think, you know, I think we ought to, uh, it's fine to support the House with their, with their letter to, you know, but um, I think if, if things don't change to quite a lot of, uh, quite a bit tomorrow, uh, then it'd be time to weigh in heavily. So with that, uh, Brian, I just want to express my uh, disappointment that, you know, we hit tomorrow and there's been a full week that's gone by that in essence could have been some of that time could have been spent getting the guidelines together so that the markets could be operating this week. And I, I'm just disappointed if in fact, they're not going to be able to. Uh, so I, I agree with Senator Polina that I think I, I would like to go on record as supporting the markets uh, being able to open as quickly as possible. And uh, I just, I, I'm very disappointed that we, I don't want to say we've wasted a week, but we've let a week go by without being able to successfully find a solution. There's got to be a solution. So you, yeah, but do you guys think indoor farmer markets are as wise as they might be? Not necessarily. I don't necessarily think that. I think that NOFA and others have come up with a set of guidelines that make sense in the, for outdoor markets. And that's kind of where I'm coming from. I, I, I'm not taking a position indoor versus outdoor. I think the outdoor seems healthier, obviously, because you can space things out more and you got more, you're in the fresh air. It's a different kind of thing. You know, we're not talking about music and pets and, you know, Crap. entertainment and crowds. We're talking about allowing farmers to set up tables and operate the way they are in other states, quite honestly. I mean, it's, it's interesting yeah. that they're doing it. And I think almost 20 other states are allowing farmers markets to go forward. I had a talk with a neighbor the other day whose young adult son lives in San Francisco. and couldn't believe that we weren't doing farmers markets, allowing farmers. He said he went, goes, people go to the market, they go up to a table, things are prepackaged. You point at the bag of potatoes you want, the farmer puts it on the table, you pick it up after the farmer backs off and you, you pay for it. I mean, it just seems like if other states can do it, I don't see why it's so difficult for us to do it when we're supposed to be such champions of farmers markets and local food. Well, um, if you did you, the committee want to make a decision on that today or would you prefer uh, to wait and see what we hear tomorrow and 
and then we could do something the first of the week. Um, I, I would just say, I, I think we're very clearly on the record of supporting farmers yeah. markets. We've, oh, definitely. we've all yeah. emailed Abby. We've heard from Abby a week ago. I, I don't feel like it's a mistake to send a letter today, but I take the chair's point that tomorrow we're getting an announcement and it, it may be, uh, duplicative and next week we would want to, you know, further push. So to me, well, I, I, I don't, I'm not against the letter. I think we're just as well to wait though. I, I don't think our letter today is going to change anything. No, Bye no, time. I don't think so either, Ruth. Yeah, I just, I would like, I w agree with that. I think if there's going to be an announcement tomorrow and I just want to push back on the idea that the past week has been wasted. I think there've been a lot of people working on trying to get updated, trying to get guidance for these markets. And most of them throughout the state haven't opened yet. There are a few that are open. And I know that two of you have those markets in your district. So I, I'm sympathetic, absolutely, Brian and Anthony. Um, but as I said before, we are in a global pandemic and we have to make sure that, that, that health considerations come first for the vendors and for the customers of these markets. And if the past week has provided the opportunity to have safer farmers markets, then I think that that's time well spent. Well, I think we'll, we'll drop this here uh, in regards to the farmer markets. Maddie, quick. Yeah, just, um, just one closing point uh, is to say that um, I totally agree with you, Ruth, that we need to put public health and safety first, but I also just want to stress that time is really critical um, in this regard because we already know, I'm not sure if you all have seen that, um, the Shelburne market has actually already decided to close for the entire 2020 season um, because they can't continue to operate under this level of uncertainty and they've decided to basically just, you know, do the things that they can control and help their farmers pivot to other uh, modes of getting their food to people. So we really are um, just very concerned about the impacts that this um, uncertainty is having on markets and on farmers. And I will say in Shelburne, you know, a lot of those um, producers may be located in areas that are a little, that have a little bit more population density and therefore farmers might have more options than they do in other areas of the state um, to pivot in that way. So we just want to stress that markets are in a really hard position and need some clear guidance. I also just want to close on the, the point that we um, agree with, I think, the the general gist of the letter as it stands right now that markets should be allowed to operate um, as outdoor you know shopping locations with very clear and appropriate social distancing and preferably not just as online pre-order and curbside pickup which you know eliminates um snap shoppers and others ability to participate so thank you and uh we're happy to come back and talk about this after we see you guys tomorrow yeah, okay. Thanks, Maddie, for your time, and we'll stay in touch. Um, Thanks, Maddie. Thanks, Maddie. Um, so um, we have now, uh, we've got Diane Bosfeldt um, on, uh, Liam Berthium. and Is Catherine on yet? Yes, I am. Yeah, good to see you all. Um, and uh, we were wondering, um, you know, we, we get calls in regards to the milk dumping issue. Um, and, um, and so I guess we'd like to hear, you know, from Leon and, and Catherine, basically in regards to, you know, how, how the milk uh, is flowing and if it, um, you know, if we're done dumping and uh, then uh, yesterday, I think it was or the day before, I was reading a bunch of material and saw where milk uh, could be um, used as fertilizer and was wondering if you folks were into that at all. Uh, instead of dumping it in a pit, you spread it like on your corn ground or things, uh, alfalfa, um, so I was wondering about that too. So I don't know if uh, DFA wants to start off or Catherine. Uh, and the other 
the other issue that has come up besides uh, dumping milk, if the production of cheese could be ramped up any busy uh, to make it, uh, you know, to use this milk up to make cheese with, and if it could be used uh, at the powder plant, if you could run that anymore to make more powder rather than just wasting the milk. So if you could comment on those issues, uh, and then we'll have a discussion. Um, Leon, Kat, do you want to fight me for it or you want to go <laughs> ahead? <laughs> you can, uh, why don't you start Catherine then I'll go second. Okay, um, well, good morning. I hope you all are doing well despite all of this, uh, these conditions right now. Um, so to give you an idea of, you know, to kind of back up for a second and help you understand why we are seeing dumping, not only in Vermont, but, you know, across the nation, it's just been unbelievable to right. see. Um, you know, you need to think about dairy demand as being made up of three functions, um, retail, food service, and exports. And the problem we're seeing right now is because of all of the shutdowns, lockdowns, whatever you want to call them, food service has essentially all but been eliminated. And so um, the demand situation has, the demand shock has created a situation where we cannot get milk into plants um, at a rate that we need to right now. So um, we are still, milk is still flowing to all of our plants as it always has. Of course, this is a tricky time of year for this all to be happening with the spring flush going on. Um, yeah. But what we're seeing is because of the loss of demand in the food service category, all of that milk is now getting backed up. And there are some plants where they may across the nation where they're only doing food service and they're having to shut down or lower their production because there's no demand for their products right now. So all of that milk then gets backed up onto the other plants and is tried, we're trying to soak it up elsewhere. And so the situation we're faced with now is, um, you know, I'm hearing conservatively that we're estimating, we have now about 10% oversupply of milk because of this loss of demand. Um, I'll tell you that in Agrimark right now, um, we're, fair, we're struggling, but we are faring a little bit better than some of our counterparts, thanks to the investments that we've made in our plants. So we have about 75% of our production that goes through our plants at any given time. Um, so we're fairly well insulated. Um, the rest of that will go to other plants, class one bottlers, et cetera. And um, by our current estimate estimates, because of the, the backup of milk, all trying to find a home in the same processing plants that are operating. We have about 5% of our production currently that is at risk for not having a home. And that's equating to roughly um, about 20 million pounds per month of milk that we're, we're really fighting to find a home for and everyone's fighting for it. So people are basically giving it away. Um, and so we are dumping milk. And unfortunately, we're in the position that until we restore the demand in food service, we're going to be dumping milk until that, that becomes resolved. Um, so to answer your question on are we, are we done dumping, I, I hate to say we're not there yet. Um, I, um, I can't speak to your, your question on milk used as fertilizer. That is so far from uh, my expertise, I won't even try. Um, well, Diane can answer that. Diane can answer that. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> in terms of can we ramp up cheese production? Can we ramp up powder production? The answer to that is yes, but we already have. Um, so in our own plants, I said that 75% of our milk typically goes through our plants. We're now operating that maybe about 78 or so percent of our milk going in. Now we can do that and we're thankful that we have the opportunity to do that, but we don't really like to run the plants that hard um, because when you do and you don't give downtime and things like that, you can, you can run into some challenges. So, um, but we do have some flexibility there. 
Um, but the problem is right now, all of that milk that was going into plants that would make food service cat products is now all competing to get into a very limited amount of processing um, that would do retail. So um, I would say at this point in time, we have ramped up cheese, powder, butter, whatever it is. Every plant that is in operation is, is operating at full capacity, if not a little bit over full capacity. Um, and you know, we're just in a situation where we just need to get that demand restored. Um, we need to get our supply under control. Um, you've probably seen there's some, um, a lot happening in that regard. We're seeing plan, we saw a plan come out of National Milk and IDFA, I think it was last week, um, suggesting an incentive for farmers to reduce production. We're also seeing cooperatives taking it into their own hands, asking farmers to exit the industry, asking them to cut their production voluntarily. Um, you know, everyone's really, really moving on this. My personal feeling is we need to move fast at a national level because if we don't address this nationally speaking, we're, it's going to be kind of, I hate to say a bloodbath. Um, but you know, if we don't resolve it nationally, people are going to take it into their own hands and, and do things and, and that will help. Um, but we're still going to be, be in a rough situation. You know, the prices look so bleak right now, especially going into May and June. And uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of farms going out of business. In have, my mind. have you folks, uh, have you instituted a, a supply demand type program at Agrimark, Kathleen? Yeah, so we did. Um, and actually, we started that in January of this year. And we did that, um, obviously, before coronavirus went into play to address some of our own internal supply challenges. Um, you know, whether we tweak that a little bit moving forward is, you know, it's a board decision that um, I'm sure we will be having, but um, we're not there yet. And, you know, the other thing for us, because we're a little insulated, and I said, it's only about that 5% of our production that we're, we're really at risk for. Um, we have a little bit of, of flexibility. And I think there's the feeling amongst our members that we, we kind of need to wait to see what happens at the national level. Um, we don't want to make any sort of move within our cooperative that then is just further challenged or, um, you know, changes the dynamics of how a national program would um, work for our farmers. So we're, I would say, in a little bit of a holding pattern for the next week or two until we start to hear some more details coming out of USDA. Yeah. Uh, questions uh, for Catherine from committee members? Uh, uh, Ruth has a question. Ruth? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, I've been following the news about Agrimark because I'm here in Addison County. Um, and I heard, I, I know that you've up, up production pretty significantly at the Middlebury plant um, and moved a lot of sort of white collar workers into the production line. And I've even seen ads looking for workers. So I'm just wondering from the labor perspective, uh, what's the situation? Um, and, and also, are you, are you feeling confident in your operations being able to follow the health guidelines for work safe, workplace safety? Yeah, good questions. Um, our labor situation right now is looking pretty good. So, you know, when when this all started breaking, even before the lockdowns went into place, I'm, I'm really proud of our team for um, how forward thinking they were and all the, um, you know, the, the contingency plans that we've had for years all of a sudden now come into full force and um, are adapted for the current situation that we were in. So, um, yeah, we've, we've tried to make some changes on the labor front to, um, you know, circulate people and just make sure that if we do have an outbreak, heaven forbid, um, we have plans in place to make sure that that plant continues to run. Um, we did ask um, some of our um, management um, office staff to assist in some of the plants, and that was hugely helpful, you know, particularly just because these guys and gals that are going into these plants, um, you know, they're really anxious. They're, they're essential workers, and um, they're hearing all the news, and they're concerned about their, their health, their family's health. Um, and so, you know, part of that was to just make sure that, you know, we're all in this together. We're, we have a nice Agrimark Cabot family. 
Um, and we want to make sure that we can give those guys and gals a break when they can. Um, I feel pretty good about where our operations are right now. Um, we haven't had any positive cases, um, though, you know, we're taking enormous steps right now to make sure that our, our um, employees are safe. Um, we have care teams set up at each of the plants, as you've probably seen, where we're taking temperatures um, before anyone comes into the plant, um, just increasing communication so people know the new sanit sanit sanitizing practices, um, social, social distancing measures, all of these different things. Um, so I, I have to say, you know, it, though this is a very challenging situation, I am, I feel so proud to be working for an organization that um, is taking care of their employees in this way. So I do feel really good. Um, and at this point, it, it seems like we may have reached that peak and hopefully we're um, getting into a better position. Um, my biggest concern would be in our West Springfield facility. There's many more cases popping up in that area. So, I, you know, that's a, a much bigger hot zone than um, our plants in New York and Vermont. Um, so I'm a little concerned there. But again, as I said, we have contingency plans in place and, and ready to um, change things up if, if there becomes an issue. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions for Catherine? Uh, if not right now, uh, uh, thank you, Catherine, and we'll move on to, to Leon. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to address the group this morning. Thank you for your continued role and leadership and involvement, you know, in agriculture. Um, Catherine certainly has, you know, covered a number of key points with you this morning. We're all working through a totally disrupted time right now that is affecting all industries in one way or another. And, you know, obviously dairy demand has, you know, obviously been impacted um, at the same time that here seasonally is when we are still, I think, ramping up our production as we normally would be doing in the spring months. Um, I think just looking at the Northeast Federal Order Pool, our March production was about 2% over last um, March. So again, um, indicating that, you know, having more challenges as production continues to climb here in these spring months. When we look at the class four usage, um, which is the butter powder, you know, category, again, we had more volume in March uh, this year than we did last year, obviously for various reasons, but, you know, about 18 and a half percent of the pool now is into that class four uh, category. So indicating that you know, more and more milk is trying to get to the balancing plants that Catherine spoke about this morning. You know, with our facilities, uh, whether it's the St. Albans location or with DFA, we're trying to process, you know, the milk at, you know, the maximum levels. Um, and we're continuing to do that here in St. Albans to serve certainly our local customers, you know, with not, not only their liquid products, um, you know, such as cream and skim condensed, but you know, our facility is also producing, you know, milk powders that's part of the broader DFA milk powder sales networks. And, uh, you know, obviously our DFA products, you know, and our powders go to U.S. customers, including many in the Northeast, as well as uh, going amount uh, to a certain amount to global customers. And we're continuing to see the milk powder demand slow, uh, whether here in the U.S., in Mexico, which happens to be obviously the US two largest markets as well as DFAs. And we're trying to continue to maneuver the supply chain and demand disruption due to the COVID-19. Um, milk production, I think was already at almost capacity levels in January. I think if you were to read that some would suggest we were already at 90% capacity now going into the spring months, I think we are trying to push every lever that we can to increase you know, more utilization of milk in our balancing plants and to work with our customers to the extent that they can take on additional milk in their facilities. Obviously there are challenges where those may not have any markets for them, but also one of the things we're seeing is increasing inventories um, that are growing at whether it's you know, these um, balancing plants or again, other processing plants, which is really creating some concerns in terms of how much inventory should a processing company continue to um, grow. And in some areas there are challenges even with cold storage um, and other warehousing um, uh, challenges. And so that could be also impactful as we're going forward. 
we certainly believe right now our commodities you know, inventories are growing and that's we're seeing that from some of the prices and the price declines that Catherine spoke about. And again, it'll be interesting to see what's happening globally as well in terms of what interventions like the uh, European Union will take as it relates to the increased you know, overall powder production. So we're in the same situation that every day is a different day in terms of how much milk is being utilized you know, by our customers. But again, every day we're maximizing, um, again, these facilities as well as other DFA facilities in the region. Um, we are, again, uh, concerned about the amount of milk that needs to be disposed of. We recognize that our members also have nutrient management plans that, again, comes to the issue around fertilizer that they need to also take into consideration if they're receiving um, any milk back at their farms. And so that's an area that, you know, certainly needs to, to be considered. Again, in terms of the cheese, you know, production, as I said, we are having conversations daily with customers terms of what more they have for capacity to convert. Um, in many cases, they already are maximizing. Others that have the capacity is because they really don't have the, you know, the market, which was again, primarily the food service market to really continue to build any more inventories. So that's where we're also seeing a decline in manufacturing capacity. So which is really creating, you know, overall challenge. Um, relative to, I think, because of this right now, um, I think everybody is really taking a hard look at their own internal policies, reevaluating all their policy options um, to deal with this situation and saying, how do we reduce, you know, overall milk production? And so many of the organizations are doing, you know, review, as Catherine said, in terms of their own policies and really looking at, you know, how do we, again, address this situation? Because we, we, or at least myself, don't anticipate that this will be re will recover from this in any time soon. So we're going to be dealing with this out of balance for months, um, you know, in the forefront. And so we've got to really address the overall milk production <coughs> or to our members that, you know, as much as milk prices are low, we can't afford to have additional milk uh, production on the market. So I'll stop there. So uh, do you do you folks at DFA have any kind of a supply control uh, system yet, Liam? Yeah, so again, initially, you know, we had established a spring over spring program that was going to take effect. Right now, we're evaluating that model and other models um, to see right now if we should be moving to, again, something a little bit more different. You know, as Catherine said, we're trying to understand what true demand is going forward. And then looking at, you know, how do we you know, determine what production levels we want to set. So we're in the process of right now discussing and, and looking at potentially making some changes to our programs. <clears throat> yeah. And you, how much of the milk, uh, your milk, do you utilize yourselves, um, you know, through, um, right through DFA's manufacturing plants? Um, again, I think, you know, we're certainly not at the level, you know, that Agrimark is, it's probably across the Northeast, we're probably in that 30 to 35% range, where the majority of the milk that we would be marketing would be to, to other processors and manufacturers in the region. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, have, have either of you um, lost any farms uh, because of uh, this virus and, you know, where they've had to get out uh, because of low milk pricing? Um, we know that there have been some farms that have made plans to um, exit this spring, even prior to COVID-19. Um, but, you know, specifically since COVID-19 right now, uh, I'm not aware of a particular farm, but I, I know that they're concerned. And I think one of the things that we need to be able to tell these farmers is what they can plan on in terms of assistance that <laughs> provided to them so they can make the best decisions. Yeah. And Catherine, have you, have you lost any at Agrimart or heard of any going out? I am not aware of any that we have lost yet at this point. I think similar to what Leon was just saying, it would be people that were planning on going out already. The thing to, um, you know, there's so many moving pieces at this point in time. You know, if you look at the milk prices, 
the lows really aren't hitting until uh, May milk. So um, at this point, it's really a lot of anxiety over, okay, two weeks from now, what's my, is my milk price really going to be $12? Catherine, you can't be right, right? Um, I, so hope, I hope you're not. I hope I'm, I like to be right, but I hope I'm really, really wrong this time around. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's going to take a little while to see all the farms go out because of the delay in milk prices. May and June is going to be run. It's really hard. I'm sure there are going to be a handful of people that are going to look and say, you know what, maybe I don't want to buy the seed, buy the fertilizer, whatever. Um, maybe now's the time to go out. But then you look at the beef market and it's just, you know, they're facing such similar challenges right now that there's not a great market to, to call your animals. Um, so that's not a great route to go down. And, and then the other thing is I think a lot of people are, are hanging on to see what the federal government comes up with in terms of assistance. Um, if they come to that for us, and I, I pray that they do, um, that could keep people lingering for a little bit longer. Um, yeah. At least to a point, you know, maybe it doesn't save them in the long term, but it at least gets them to the point where they can withstand the next couple of months. Um, and then when, you know, alternative, the, you know, the beef market or something comes back into play, they have a better, um, better way to exit the industry. So uh, I, I see that the, the tide of losses is certainly coming our way, unfortunately, but I, I hope that we can um, cut those losses with, with some federal assistance. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just curious, you know, both of you are, are co-ops that are farmer owned. Um, and yet it always feels like farmers are sort of treated like independent contractors. And, and I'm curious, this, the, the statement that we anticipate some farms going under, do, do, do we, can you, can you talk about what steps each of um, the businesses are doing? Do, do you just react to that? Or is there ever a time where the co-op says, you know, if people could reduce production by 15%, we think we could keep everybody afloat or, you know, any kind of uh, co-op wide strategy that you, you ever uh, attempt or, or, or talk about or, or work with members on, or is it truly just um, that, that the market takes care of it and, and you roll with whatever comes down the line? Uh, th this is Leon. I'll start. And I think um, there is no question that, you know, certainly as a cooperative, we try to provide as many services, certainly and support um, to our members as we can. But ultimately, you know, first and foremost, the overall milk price will have the, the greatest impact to the financial viability, you know, of the farms. And I think that's right now what we're all wrestling with. And you know, you, you, you're aware of the National Milk IDFA proposal. Again, trying to send the message that we do need to reduce overall milk production sooner than later if we're going to be able to have you know, any impact um, to these markets going forward in the short term. Mm -hmm. I think from the cooperative level, obviously, we're trying to bring production back in line with our own markets in the region. So again, that's why many of us have instituted, whether it's two-tier pricing, base excess, or some other type of program to try to, you know, allocate costs, you know, appropriately across the membership so that, again, not all members are bearing the costs of someone else's growth, for example. So we're looking at that respect. I think the other thing that we've tried to do is over more recent years is encourage members to look at risk management strategies. So again, this is where the dairy margin coverage program comes into play. And unfortunately, we have a very small sign up of farms in Vermont this year. Um, and that's why it's imperative that we get that dairy margin coverage program reopened because that will help soften the impact of the lower milk prices that we're expecting. But we have members that also do forward contracting and other elements that again, will assist them through this downturn You know, as, as we move through the spring months that Catherine has spoken about. So and then we also really assist them on, you know, certainly leveraging their purchasing power right now and their cash flow 
which again can assist some of these farms, especially through the spring months when there is a more outlay of cash. So I'll pass it on to Catherine to see what you'd like to add. Yeah, I mean, I'll echo all of those and just add, you know, it's the best thing. I mean, there's so many things, so many avenues that we're trying to take right now to, to help our individual farmer members at, you know, the federal level and exploring all of their different options. Um, but we also need to make sure, you know, one major way to support our farmers is to make sure that they have a market for their milk and a co-op that is strong enough to survive financially. Um, so, you know, it's, it's always that balance of, um, you know, helping the farmers as much as we can, giving them as much of, of a price as we can while also making sure that we are able to continue operation. Um, you know, one thing that's been really helpful or we see is going to be very helpful as we've applied for an SBA loan. Um, and so, you know, if, if that can help the co-op and all of the extra costs that we have been incurring, um, as I talked about, I think with increasing our wages to hazard pay for our employees, um, all these different things that the co-op's doing to just make sure that product continues to flow, um, that will be very helpful for our financials. And when our financials are strong, that puts less pressure on the co-op having to go back to the farmer owners to <clears throat> support some of the losses. So we're, we're happy that that opportunity was made available. Yeah, uh, questions from committee members, uh, Ruth? Yeah, thank you, Bobby. Uh, you both have touched on sort this issue a little bit and Chris's question got to this. Um, a bit, but in under normal circumstances, whatever that is, um, and under this current not normal circumstance, do you have programs that that sort of help farmers with retirement planning? And you know, you mentioned that there were some farmers who already had been planning to go out this spring. And what are you what do you do under normal circumstances, and what are you doing now to help farmers? who may decide to leave the industry and retire just because they want to retire and do so with dignity and you know money to support themselves in their later years. Uh, this is a little out of my knowledge area um, given my short time with Agrimark, but um, you know, I'll, I'll just mention quickly that all of our farmers have equity in our company. So when they do retire, um, they get that equity back over time. We have, um, are very proud. We've never had um, an issue where farmers have, have not received that equity back. So there is that in place. Um, but certainly there's still the challenges, you know, if, if you can't sell your animals and things along those lines that right. um, are going to make the exit um, very challenging. I, and I appreciate your comment about the, the beef market right now is also in the tank. And so calling a herd is, is not really a, a viable financial option for a farmer who may want to go out. So you're recommending sort of waiting to see if that market comes back or, or how, what are you doing for those farmers who are trying to make that decision? I'm not making a recommendation. Um, you know, that's an individual business decision that we would not get involved with. Um, but I'm, I'm suggesting that that could be a reason why we may not see an immediate, um, a short-term loss of farms, it may be a little more dragged on because I, I would guess that some people are going to be looking at that and saying, well, you know what, I can hang on for a couple of more months and then perhaps be better situated when this all resolves and there is a market for, for my animals. Um, but that's just my personal, personal take on it. Um, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, how, uh, do you think there's any chance uh, working with your folks in Washington, uh, you know, the uh, National Association and working with our delegation, is there any chance of them opening the uh, milk protection uh, price, pricing sign up back up or is that gone forever? Are you talking and, about the dairy margin coverage program, Bob? Yeah, have yeah. you talked with Leahy or any of those guys? Yeah, so I think you know our congressional delegation understands the importance of you know um, reopening the dairy margin uh, coverage program and making that retroactive under these extreme circumstances. There's certainly support by National Milk and IDFA as well. So I think as an industry at large, everyone 
is supportive of that. So I'm really hopeful that uh, again, with Secretary Purdue, that that will be one of those immediate actions that he takes. And I think that's, you know, if there's a message right now that we have for our congressional delegation and administration is that they've got to let the farmers know what decisions that they're gonna, you know, make sh their decisions as quickly as possible so everyone can plan accordingly. So we need to know, is the dairy margin coverage program going to reopen? What is there going to be a direct payment? Are we going to support the National Milk IDFA proposal? The sooner that those decisions can be made, the better off our industry will be going forward. Yeah, and Diane, I think um, uh, Anson, he's weighed in on some of this, uh, I believe, is that accurate? Yes, um, this is Diane Bothell, Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Yes, uh, Secretary Tebbets, along with the secretaries and commissioners in New England, as well as Maryland, all requested for the dairy margin coverage program to be reopened and retroactive. Um, we have been taking part in phone calls with Secretary Purdue, and um, his quote was uh, reopening the uh, dairy margin coverage program would be like buying fire insurance after the barn had burned. So he's not overly supportive. It may have to be a congressional um, requirement in some form of legislation. So he's getting, Secretary Purdue is getting tremendous pressure to reopen our uh, dairy margin coverage program and make it retroactive. But uh, that quote makes me think it's not top on his list to do unless Congress tells him to. Uh, and currently that would have to take part in another stimulus bill or something of that nature down in D.C. And we know uh, from any of the uh, news outlets that that's not going very far right now. So um, that is what I know about reopening the dairy margin coverage program. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, other questions for our, for our guests? Uh, Anthony? Yeah, I, I was sitting, I had decided to sit silent during most of this conversation, but I can't resist a couple of things. One is that as bad as the USDA has been, Secretary Purdue is right in the sense that it's a little too late. It may be a little too late unless you could do these things retroactively, which is difficult to imagine happening. I wish it would. I also want to remind folks of two things. Last time we talked with, I think it was Catherine about Agrimark. I just need to remind people every time that Agrimark is not a co-op and you can look at the lawsuit that the farmers brought against Agrimark to make that clear. It's just a technical little glitch, but to keep saying the co-op this and co-op that, it's not a co-op. So I just want to point that out. And also that these organizations, including Agrimark and others, for years opposed supply management programs, which if we had supported them, they'd be in place today. And we wouldn't have the need for milk dumping and these low prices because we'd be able to adjust to the market more quickly. So this, these groups have opposed supply management programs and pretended to be co-ops when they're not. So I just want to make that clear. I can't, can't resist. <clears throat> well, of course, uh, that's like um, saying we should have closed the barn door and the horse is already out of the barn. Um, right, but we should. We, that's a point. That's exactly my point is we should have closed the barn door before the horse got out. But there are, those, do that. there are those with supply management programs that are also disposing of milk right now. Again, this is a market phenomenon in terms of the loss of the demand for um, dairy overnight, if you will, and even if you had a supply management program would not avoid the situation of, um, again, the disposal of milk at this point in time, we would have to recalibrate and that's what this industry needs to do as we go through 2020 is recalibrate in terms of, you know, what is going to be the new demand for dairy um, in the US and globally and we're all going to need to make some adjustments to that. Yeah, but it would just be good if we had a program in place that would allow us to recalibrate and actually react promptly. Well, this is Diane. I think the reaction time is the tough part. The shock has hit and, uh, you know, the loss of food service is a tremendous drop in demand. Once right. things reopen, how much of that comes back? Nobody knows. And if we reacted right now to cut 10% of the dairy herd across the whole United States to, to come back into, into line with that, um, milk need, if it comes back and the 10% comes back all at once, there wouldn't be enough milk there. Cows don't respond quickly enough. You can decrease quickly by slaughtering animals, but to ramp back up and have the milk increase quickly is not as easy. So yeah, but I'm, not talking, I'm, not talking, I'm, not, I'm not proposing we decrease the number of farmers. I'm talking about decreasing the volume that's produced through the supply management program. 
Correct. Even if you reduce the number of cows, making that volume of milk, reducing is easy. Replacing it is hard. It's much slower. So that's, that's the a, question when you have a shock. Even a supply management program can't keep up with a market shock. But when we lose these farmers, which we're going to lose, those are, they're not going to be replaced. You know, we can replace sure. cows, but we're not going to replace the farmers. Understood. Dr. Yeah, Moore, I appreciate the dilemma you're in. I just think it's, it's frustrating to watch this happen over the years. Uh, so, Leon, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, in your first comment something about uh, trying to to keep the far make the farmers that have increased their production pay for the oversupply and not burden farmers that have retained their production at a steady um, uh, production level. Uh, is there, are you guys working on something like that? Well, again, I think, you know, prior to this, I mean, obviously it's the allocation of the additional costs. And I think that was really kind of where we were going with the spring over spring program is again, yeah. you know, to really look at how should those costs across the cooperative be shared. And so it was really looking at it where there was the growth and there was the additional balancing costs that those costs should be borne on those additional pounds of milk that needed to be, you know, uh, maybe marketed under different conditions. So that's where that is. So now, now we're having to tweak it differently and say, now we're looking at, if we have too much milk. Now what's the next step? It's not just the growth, you know, that a farm might have year over year. If the whole organization has to reduce its production, whether it's, you know, 10%, 15%, you know, how do we go about going to that process and looking at what's the most equitable way to do that. Yeah. No, the, uh -huh. If I could chime in, I think we also need to think about, um, you know, we're hearing, I've heard at least one semi-local farm having some issues with um, an outbreak potentially of COVID-19 on their farms and the issues that that may have for their entire, entire labor source. Um, that's a rumor at this point in time, but I, I just bring that up only because that could be a reality for us oh. where we we could have a supply situation in the opposite um so i think my personal opinion is when we we look at managing um the supply right now we need to probably be looking at it from an incentive perspective um and not at putting a cap because we don't know what you know this is a demand shock that we're dealing with and we don't know what our situation is going to be um, a week from now, even never mind a few a few months from now. Um, so it's it's a very fluid situation that um, I think if we can have it be a little less rigid than some of the proposals um, that are coming, or that we we we're talking about more incentive based, it would be more helpful. Um, is there is there anything that uh, we as your local uh, you know senators uh, can do to assist? Uh, assist in any way uh, going moving forward Bes you know, besides the routine stuff like pushing our congressional delegation and and uh, you know trying to get them to get something done in DC uh, I we haven't talked about because our finances here in Vermont are in shambles of course and uh, once a uh, we get a little bit of a handle on our federal money coming and where that's going. We might end up with a little bit left over that we might be able to head in in the ag direction, but with the medical system being in disarray and and the colleges all being messed up and our uh, regular you know K to twelve schools and people not working, uh, this, our tax situation is looking uh, bleaker every day. Uh, but is there anything that you can think of that we might be able to help with at all? Just drink more milk, <laughs> eat more cheese. <laughs> well, that's a great start. I think that's one of the things we're trying to do with some of our partners is to encourage them to use you know, more cheese, you know, or other dairy products in what they're producing. If we could put more cheese on every pizza, that would be helpful. 
Um, you know, obviously, you know, our organization and others are working with the food banks, you know, as well. And I think that's another piece in terms of what are all the different avenues that we can get dairy products back out um, into those that, that need product. Um, we've been really working with the agency of ag and also just keeping everybody apprised that if they're seeing signs at the retail level, you know, limiting purchases of dairy, dairy products, trying to, again, you know, avail themselves to everything that there is available to, again, stock these um, grocery stores um, and retail outlets with, with dairy, I think has really been, you know, the other piece of that. Um, I think the challenge might be, again, not knowing, you know, there may be some farmers that may have some challenges if they are, or we need them to, again, receive more milk um, back on the farm. I don't know how that's going to impact their nutrient management plans. So that could be a challenge, not knowing, you know, what the months ahead look like. Um, but um, so in any case, I think we got to continue to keep dairy and ag in the forefront as we go forward. Yeah, and, you know, just... I, the committee may may have picked up on this, but I think it was last Friday's meeting maybe that we had as a full Senate. There was three or four senators that said they'd been to the grocery store and they wanted to know where the Cabot cheese was because there wasn't any in the stores. Have, have you folks, Catherine, had trouble getting your distributors to get the cheese out and uh, products to market all right well it's been flying off the shelves it, it really yeah. has been and um you know we we've had um in in our efforts to address the situation we've done things like um change the the products that we're we're making um you know just focusing on our core ones um you know our our retail partners, they just want to make sure if they don't have our specialty, you know, whatever it is, bacon, cheddar, whatever, um, you know, so long as they have something on their shelves, they're, they're, they're pretty happy. Um, so we're continuing to pump out as much as possible. As I said, we've increased our, you know, the amount of product through our facilities in an effort to do this. We are um, changing up some of our transportation to make sure that trucks are continuing to not full getting um shipments to the stores as much as possible but certainly i mean we're just the consumer behavior out there is so different than it's ever been um you know the the hoarding mentality as we're, we're talking about is making it a challenge to keep those stores uh stocked but we're, we're doing darnest and uh we'll continue to work hard on that well th thank you are there any other questions for catherine or leon uh this time Senator Starr, you had a question about, um, or one of your, one of your, your, you had about milk as a fertilizer. Do you yes. want me to address that, or are you, yeah. are you happy enough with what you've heard? Well, I don't know. Catherine and Leon are the ones that, you know, if they're going to have to dump milk, uh, maybe uh, we could use it as a, you know, as a supplement to the corn crop or something to. Uh, rather than putting it in the manure pit, might be able to cut down on farmers' overall cost of commercial fertilizer. Well, we're requesting if milk is going into the manure pit that our, we have a recommendation up on our website that uh, a sample of that manure be taken prior to spreading that manure. And then they can get a, a new, um, new analysis of what that milk is added to that uh, manure pit. Rick, currently, we're not recommending direct spreading on land, and I don't believe anybody has requested that at this point. Um, it's about timing. Uh, soils are pretty wet right now with all the rain we've had. We're trying to help people understand their manure spreading as well right now. Uh, it's really wet. Uh, watching the weather forecast closely, et cetera. Um, so we're, and it's a bit early, it's, it's starting to happen, yeah. but it's a bit early for tilling the soil. And um, there are concerns around milk going directly that it be tilled in because of a potential odor issue. Um, manure smells like one thing, milk smells something different. Um, or even milk and manure together can be pretty potent. So trying to make sure people are able to till that in. Um, so we haven't had anybody request direct application. Uh, we've already talked to A&R about any permitting requirements, if anybody was going to direct 
um, spread milk and they would rather it go in the manure pit as well. So that's what, if milk has been dumped, that's what's occurring at this point. Two other points, we gained four farms from the beginning of March to the beginning of April. We have some farms, dairy cow farms. We have some farms that come back from a period of dry off. They're seasonal dairies. So that could be occurring for those plus four. And uh, we are going out with more information around the Farm First program, farm viability, UVM extension, and the Ag Mediation Service for farmers for those questions, Ruth, around what do I do? Do I stay in? Do I get out? Um, I've got major stress levels, all those kind of things. So we're pushing those resources out as well. Uh, and this afternoon, we're meeting with Agrimark and St. Albans, HP Hood, Stony Field, and the Food Bank to talk about how, if there are going to be diverted loads, how we can make that into a product um, yeah. that the food bank, how much can they handle, how much can they distribute, um, all those questions. So that um, getting everybody in one place to really start hammering out those details will start this afternoon. Well, it sound, that sounds good, Diane. And uh, what about the uh, yogurt plan out of Rattleboro, are they going to be in on that discussion this afternoon? No, not at this point. Uh, we started working with the folks that had approached us first um, and are willing. We approached the Commonwealth yogurt uh, two years ago when we thought we we're going to have excess milk around the holidays. And uh, they had plans for their workforce to be off at that point as well. So they weren't interested. Um, if this becomes I think the first big question is what can the food bank handle? Because a tractor trailer load of milk makes an awful lot of cups of yogurt. Um, so we need to figure out how much they can handle first. And uh, as, as Leanna and Catherine are speaking about how much milk is gonna be available that doesn't have some other type of home um, and what can we get figured out? So if, if there's going to be a demand, we'll try to move it around to other processing facilities uh, besides the ones that have come forward first with interest um, so we'll go from there. Well, I think the positive PR that all the players would get on, from something like this happening uh, would be super good. It'd be a lot better than, you know, Agrimark donates two tanker loads of milk or saying a DFA uh, then dumping two loads of milk. Uh, to the food bank. So things like that would would really go a long ways uh, amongst policymakers and constituents. So uh, good luck to you on that. And uh, and uh, let's hope we can keep our, our farmers somewhat healthy and safe from the virus, but financially, uh, hopefully we can keep them on the right side of the ledger. Um, so, um, if there are no other questions from committee members, uh, I'd like to thank both uh, Catherine and Leon for spending uh, your time with us this morning. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate you all being uh, willing to help us as we all manage our way through this uncertain time. So. Um, everyone stay safe. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we've got a few uh, minutes left committee that uh, I don't know if Carrie has gotten on the line yet. Uh, um, there he is. God, you fill that whole screen up, Carrie. I can do wow. better. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, uh, we wondered, uh, talking with you on the uh, uh, municipal solid waste stuff, uh, if there's been any uh, headway made on that and, and testing of the fields uh, or going to be testing fields. Uh, you know, uh, we have concerns about, about the loss of these farmlands that, with this stuff being spread on them about, um, you know, not being worth anything. Uh, so where are we on that particular issue, uh, Carrie? So nothing's really changed um, since the last time we talked, but I guess I didn't, I wasn't clear enough about uh, everything we've been doing with DEC. Um, DEC has gone around and tested 
um, soil and groundwater in in a sort of <clears throat> randomized pattern um, of everywhere that gets land applications. And that- uh, What are they testing for, Carrie? The PFOA, PFOS compounds, um, both the, the five regulated compounds as well as other chemistry in the same class. So it's a wide variety then of issues. It is, yes. <clears throat> and what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, some the soils are, 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 are an issue, but what the real driver is going to be with this uh, contamination is the groundwater. Um, we've got serious concerns about the groundwater um, in and around these fields. Um, there are a few farms that use that water, but most of the farms are on municipal um, water supplies or their wells are further away from the fields. Have you tested any uh any crops uh, that have been grown on those fields to see if um, if it shows up in the crops? So we haven't, we did have a long discussion about doing that last fall, um, but it's um, a corn silage is not homogenous. And when we're sort of even testing for aflatoxins in parts per billion, we're talking a five to 10 pound sample that we have to completely dry and grind and take an aliqua of. When we're looking at parts for in parts per trillion, something as unhomogeneous as silage, um, we didn't think having a number there would give us any indication about whether that feed was good or not. Um, we would have had to take basically hundreds of samples to get a good reading off a off a silage corn lot. Um, that said, we did use the values for silage corn that were developed in Maine to make a determination that Maine has developed a model um, that they didn't test the silage corn in the middle um, as much as the milk at the end. So they had a value, a soil value that would lead to a milk value and they do have enough data to, they did have enough data to generate crop uptake coefficients. They're fairly conservative um, based on the modeling. And we did use those equations to make determinations about <clears throat> what to test or how to mitigate the problem. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, where are you guys uh, moving forward with uh, or with DC or uh, to do more testing um, this this year? Is that where we are? Or? Um, so, yeah, basically both agencies are in agreement that more regulation is needed over this practice. And um, we haven't really come to uh, any decision points about what those mitigation steps might be. But indeed, we need to be looking at what's being put on the land as well as what's already there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's uh, very important. I know. I don't. Uh, Chris, have you talked with uh, with Bray or any of those guys about if they're what they're doing with with the? I think they have a bill in their room, or they've at least talked about about this. Um, or Michael's here. So, Michael, do you do you know anything about that issue? Uh, they have taken testimony from from A and R. Um, I don't believe they both the House and the Senate have, uh, and from Kerry, I think, at least in one of those committees. And uh, I am not sure uh, if they've developed um, uh, what they want to do going forward. <laughs> Well, um, I'll have to speak with, uh, with Chris and I mean, uh, you do both committee, uh, you know, House and Senate and Ag and uh, 
natural. So we can work on that uh, together, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, were there other questions for Carrie? Well, everybody's good. Yep. Uh, Michael, do you have anything that you wanted to bring up to the committee at all, or? Actually, I do have a quick question for Carrie. Just, just occurred to me, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, Carrie, our seed bill, our hemp seed bill, probably didn't make it across the finish line at this point, yeah. right? I believe it did. Yep. Yeah, uh, we it was in uh, house ag. Yeah, well, they're got, doing. They got I, two house ag, but I assume they haven't been able to act on it yet. They have. I believe they actually voted out of committee. It's and, it's on the I think notice calendar, well, and, and right. on the house side, but it you know it, we haven't gotten to where we can deal with these issues yet. You know either either side we we got to get COVID fixed if we can. So okay. Senator Pearson, I did propose um, some language that would have fit nicely with the chicken and compost bill um, to deal with any waste going to a farm. Uh, Michael O'Grady has that language if you would like to look at it or I can send it to you directly. Well, wow. Mike, Mike cleaned it up very nicely um, for us. And what it does is allow us to register anything that's being applied to ag land as a soil amendment and that whatever that soil amendment is be not adulterated and um, adulteration is any deleterious component material whether it be heavy metals pfoa compounds or whatever comes down the pike next um, that was that just a proposal how i believe we could deal with this issue um, but in I don't know if you're going to be able to get adequate testimony on that this year. Well, and th and then back to the hemp seed, I assume, um, well, I guess I'm curious if we've heard if this issue is surfacing. People, hemp farmers are surely getting seeds in now and getting ready to go. So um, if you could just help us keep an eye on this. I will. Thanks. Yeah. Um, any any other questions? Did you, uh, Michael? I just want to clarify the the C bill is still in House Ag Committee. They they've got it all teed up to go, but they haven't voted it out yet because they they haven't really they haven't mastered remote voting yet. Um, so so they're ready, but it, it, they haven't actually voted it out. Um, you haven't you haven't shown them how they could uh, vote remotely yet, Michael. Well, they only got their training last week on it, so. Oh, because we could we could give you a demonstration how we could vote <laughs> remotely. Just somebody make a motion to adjourn, and we'll show you how that works. We'll let Ruth record the roll call. <laughs> um, well, if there isn't anything else, um, we'll we'll pay attention to the press conference tomorrow, hopefully, and and um, we'll move forward from that point. If things don't go well, we'll uh, we'll address that issue again shortly, early next week. Um, so if there isn't anything else, uh, thank you all very much uh, for your I just like I, I hope next time we can talk about farm workers. And I sent an email around. Senator Hardy's been been banging on this one, too. We, we've got to at least explore so we understand what's going on for workers on our farms, many of whom are undocumented and are having, therefore, completely exempted from every piece of assistance that come down I, well, I, i'd hope we can spend time on that I you know for what it's for what it's worth we actually heard about that in gov ops also so it is an important issue that we should talk about I, at this committee i read in one of the publications that if you were a resident doesn't say anything about where you're from if you're a resident of the state that you could receive um 
like that six hundred dollars, um, you know, stuff. No, I, I don't. I don't think so. I did bring this up um, with uh, Deputy Secretary Eastman. Um, this very question about whether or not farm workers who are not U.S. citizens, whether or not they're documented, but what just that they aren't U.S. citizens, if they qualify for any of the federal programs. She said she would talk to the federal delegation um, or her connections at the feds about it, um, but that to her knowledge, um, they weren't eligible, but I, I don't wanna speak for her. So we should have her back to talk about this issue, but I don't think that they are eligible regardless of their immigrant status. Hmm. Well, of course they aren't, they aren't receiving unemployment though, because they're already employed, right? Awesome. Right, if, if, they're, if they're still working and getting, and getting paid, then they wouldn't be getting unemployment. But I think there was a concern of if they um, did come, come down with COVID and had to stop working, they wouldn't be getting any kinds of benefits. They wouldn't qualify for the unemployment that other people would, that, that citizens do. And they may not have the supports. They probably wouldn't have the supports, certainly, that, that American citizens have. Yet they are working in our state. They're paying taxes to you know, the state and feds. Yeah. And so there's a concern that they're just not getting taken care of at the same level as other workers in our state. Well, one, one thing we want to make darn sure of, uh, you know, we were talking uh, at our last uh, general meeting that we were going to do money for um, essential workers. Um, you know, and how it wasn't a cheap issue that was going to cost us a lot of money as a state, but we we all felt that, you know, the essential workers uh, should be, I think I just fell off, no, it was my <laughs> iPad that tipped over, it wasn't me, Paul. Uh, <laughs> we want to make sure that, why don't we make sure, or try to make sure that um, farmers get uh, included in that list of uh, people that are going to get uh, the extra money. The point is there's a lot to discuss and I hope we can put it on uh, on a, an agenda and have really sussed through the issues because there are several issues there. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll make sure that's on uh, the next trip around. Thank you. Any, anything else? All set here. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you all again. And uh, I think we're back on tomorrow morning as a uh, Senate at 1030, maybe. So but it'll, it'll be a caucus, I think, not a, a floor session. Oh, uh, they've already decided. Well, I thought when we left, that's what Jim said. Yeah. Okay. Am I incorrect? I think he was going to let us know um, for sure. He needed okay. to check in with GovOps and Senate Finance about whether their bills would be ready. Um, right. So he was he right. was going to let us know by the end of the day. Okay. But one way or another, we're together. Brian, yeah. Yeah. Brian, do we have a one o'clock meeting? We have a one o'clock committee meeting today. Yes, Anthony. That's what I thought. I didn't see if I didn't see an invite to our but Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Hey. Thanks, Guy, and thanks, Michael and Linda, for all your hard work. It, it's still a bummer, but we'll get through it. Take care. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Yeah.